For example, let us see this film. This is an operation to reach the appendix through the anterior abdominal wall. This incision is on the surface anatomy of the cecum, and we have learned that. Cutting the skin, under the skin you can see the fat, which is what? Superficial fascia, camper's fascia. And then, surgeon reaches the white area here, which is what? Scarpus fascia. Now, he is holding inferior epigastric artery and vein. Now, a hole in scarpus fascia, expanding the hole, and you start to see the muscles can see the red muscles here, which is the external oblique. Now, we should not cut the muscle, because if we cut the muscle, we have to suture it. And it heals with scar tissue, fibrous tissue, and becomes weak. Therefore, the surgeon, uh, when he recognizes the external oblique, he should separate the muscle fibers. And he should know the direction of the muscle fibers. Okay? So now, he is going to separate the external oblique muscle fibers. No cutting, see? No cutting. What comes under it is internal oblique and then transversus abdominis. Now, when he separates all the muscles, what am I going to see? Peritoneum. How do I describe the peritoneum? It's a membrane, right? It's a shiny membrane. That is the peritoneum. Why should the surgeon pull it up? Because he wants to make an incision, open the peritoneal cavity. And if he cuts without pulling up, he may cut important structure, right? So he's going to pull it up by two 
artery forceps and make a hole. When he makes a hole, the peritoneal cavity is open. And then he expands. That's one artery. That's the other artery forceps. Pull up. Make an incision. You see this hole? This is a hole opened into the peritoneal cavity. Now, make the incision bigger. And you see what here? You see the cecum. You can see these hostrations, right? This is the beginning of the ascending colon, and that he will look for the appendix here. Okay. He learned this important steps of anatomy of the anterior abdominal wall in second year or third year medical school. And he has to remind himself uh, over the years. Now, doctors are not butchers. They do not hold the knife and do this on the human body. No, it should be layer by layer. Now, when the surgeon comes out, he should suture layer by layer. That means peritoneum first, make a knot, then relieve the muscle because the muscles are not cut. Once the patient wakens up and contracts his abdominal wall, everything is going to be set to normal. And then he sutures the superficial fascia, and then the skin. It is not that one bite all layers. <coughs> if he does that, then <coughs> with time, probably short time, the <coughs> layers will open and result in incisional hernia. So we have to know the anterior abdominal wall. The anterior abdominal wall is, is well built and it is very good for normal life. Very well built for normal life. <clears throat> now, some people will, will be exposed to something extraordinary. This extraordinary event is increased intra-abdominal pressure. Like chronic coughing, chronic straining, uh, holding and lifting heavy weights. You know, weightlifters, they, they wear what? They wear belts to support the anterior abdominal wall. Sometimes the anterior abdominal wall under these conditions gives way. And when it gives way, organs, usually intestine, comes into this abnormal position and it may create problem. We will see that. We have common <coughs> anterior abdominal hernia. This is in the epigastric region, epigastric hernia, umbilical, inguinal, and femoral. We will have some <coughs> stories about the inguinal and 
the femoral. Okay. This is a patient with inguinal hernia. As you can see, the inguinal canal is from anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle, and this is a simple inguinal hernia, which is superior to the inguinal ligament. This is a hernia which is inferior to the inguinal ligament. It is coming from the femoral canal of the <coughs> uh, femoral sheath. We will come to the story of this hernia. This is a huge <coughs> indirect inguinal hernia. It is filling the whole half of the scrotum. So hernia can be simple and can be severe ones. This is a hernia that comes in front of you. It is superior to the inguinal ligament, okay, and it is nearer to the midline. This is direct inguinal hernia. You will see these hernia uh, along your life. They are common, especially the indirect inguinal hernia. This person has double inguinal hernia on the right and on the left. These are the common types of inguinal hernia. Now, if you memorize the anterior abdominal wall, you think you will have a lifelong experience of these muscles. And you have to change your thinking. You have to change. You have no choice but to change you are thinking and it is time to start now probably late probably late because we should not memorize we should think you see learning is fun when you start reading a subject and you understand it and you learn it, you enjoy yourself. But if you memorize it, and here's an important question. How many words can I memorize every day? Stays in your mind for a long time. How many sentences? Not a lot, but if you learn, if you understand, it stays for life. And memorizing is boring. <clears throat> if you find yourself that you are bored, then you are not learning. You are memorizing. Because we need to learn more, more and more and more. If you peek at science, having studied the external oblique muscle of the abdomen, that takes you half, half a minute or a minute, then you leave it and go to something else, you are peeking into it. And there should be no peaking. And to peak is to glance quickly. Einstein once said, you need to stay with the subject longer. We are saying this and we are doing all this is for the sake of the future. 
I remind you of the future every day. It's your future. <coughs> now let's start seeing the story of the inguinal region. The inguinal region contains the inguinal canal that has an internal opening, a canal over the inguinal ligament and an external opening. This was the way for the testis to come down into the bottom of the scrotum. And the story starts with the anterior abdominal wall. Laterally, it is fleshy and medially is aponeurotic. Aponeurosis means very flat tendon. And there is a midline, which is called linea alba. Now, what is happening here? Here is a diagram of cross-section of the abdominal walls. Now, the posterior wall is very well supported by the vertebral column and group of pre-vertebral and post-vertebral muscles. The lateral wall is made of three muscles, external oblique, internal oblique, and transversus abdominis. Now, when we come anterior, we have special arrangement. We have special arrangement, and it's called the rectus sheath. Here's a diagram of the rectus sheath. <coughs> to start with, these are the three layers of the anterior abdominal wall. External oblique, internal oblique, and transversus abdominis. And they change from fleshy red muscles into aponeurosis. Now, let's see what is going to happen. The internal oblique aponeurosis is going to split into anterior layer and posterior layer. The external oblique aponeurosis comes and joins the anterior layer. And both of them reach the midline. The, inter the transversus abdominis is going to join the posterior leaflet of the internal oblique posterior to the rectus muscle. And this is the rectus sheath. It is designed to make the anterior abdominal wall stronger. Now, is this a story all the way around the upper point and the lower point? The answer is no. This section is above the arcuate line. The arcuate line is halfway between umbilicus and pubis symphysis. And its story is just what we have told. Splitting of internal oblique, joining of external oblique to the anterior leaflet, Transversus abdominis joins the posterior leaflet. Now, the section below the arcuate line, the arcuate line equals end of posterior leaflet of rectus sheath. When we go below the arcuate line, this is what happens. The internal oblique aponeurosis does not split 
and the external oblique and the transversus abdominis, they all come anterior to the rectus abdominis muscle and they reach the midline. What is left to cover the posterior or the deep surface of these muscles is fascia transversalis and peritoneum. Okay? Now, this is how the design of the anterior abdominal wall is made for the sake of being strong enough for normal life. Now, in real life, we can see the linea alba, rectus abdominis, another rectus abdominis, and we can see the three muscles. External oblique, internal oblique, and transversus abdominis. Let's look here. This aponeurosis of the internal oblique is going to split to cover the rectus abdominis anteriorly and posteriorly. External oblique aponeurosis will join the anterior <coughs> part. Transversus abdominis will join the posterior part around the rectus abdominis. Again, repeated. <clears throat> what is this image telling me? It is telling me that <clears throat> here are the three abdominal muscles, and this is the rectus abdominis, and this is the place where here the place where the aponeuroses of the three muscles rearrange and form the rectus sheath. Under certain, certain conditions, this area becomes weak. And when it becomes weak, these certain conditions will push an organ into this weak area. And we can see that there are structures with the lumen, these are small intestine, are what? Protruding through this weak area. Protruding through this weak area and becoming under the skin. You can see the skin is elevated. So this is a hernia occurring at the point of formation of rectus sheath. It's called spagillian hernia. It is not common, but it tells us a story of why we should know the rectus sheath. If you look at this cadaver, this is <coughs> looking at the atier abdominal wall and these are the two recti muscles, right rectus and left rectus muscle pulled down. And you can see here is the end of rectus sheath. This is called arcuate line. Quick summary of muscles of the anterior abdominal wall. This is the external oblique muscle. It comes from ribs 5 to 12. <coughs> then there is a gap and it arises from iliac crest, anterior part, all the way. And it makes <coughs> the inguinal ligament and 
cubic crest and cubic tubercle and the fibers were run down and immediately, like putting your hand in your front pocket. And they become, the muscle becomes upon neurotic and goes to the rectus. <coughs> Changes from fleshy to upon neurotic. And linear alba is attached to the xiphoid process. Then we have the story of internal oblique. <coughs> it comes from lower ribs, 10 to 12. Okay. lumbosacral fascia. The external oblique did not have origin from the lumbosacral fascia. Then the iliac crest. Then the inguinal ligament. And it stops, the inguinal ligament extends to the pubic crest and pubic tubercle. Okay. And this is the direction of the muscle fibers putting the hand in the back pocket. If you notice that the internal oblique does not arise from all the inguinal ligament because it is going to leave the inguinal ligament to make the roof of the inguinal canal, which we will come to this story shortly. Transversus abdominis, costal cartilages, not ribs, costal cartilages, lumbosacral fascia, iliac crest, inguinal ligament, not all the inguinal ligament, it also stops on the lateral one third of the inguinal ligament, okay, and goes medially, becomes aponeurotic and forms the formation of the rectus sheath. This is the line where <coughs> transversus abdominis <coughs> stops. Now, let's analyze this image. It's an image of the lower end of all abdominal muscles, the inferior ends. And this is the anterior abdominal wall. This is the skin, this is the peritoneum. These are the three layers. If we check the transversus abdominis, it comes down, okay, and stops. Does not continue to the inguinal ligament. That's on the medial side. Internal oblique comes down and stops. does not come down to the inguinal ligament. The external oblique comes down all the way, okay, and turns in and makes the inguinal ligament. So if this is the inguinal canal, okay, the internal transversus abdominis, the internal oblique, they share in the formation of the roof of the inguinal canal. The external oblique will form the anterior wall and the floor. And it stops. This is the inguinal canal and this is the spermatic cord. 
campus fascia continues down to the thigh and scarpus fascia stops two inches below the inguinal ligament. And this is the peritoneum. Okay, sorry, this is transversus fasciae. If you see this arrow here, you see that the posterior wall of the inguinal canal is made by fascia transversalis. So now we know anterior wall is made of external oblique aponeurosis. Roof is internal oblique and transversus abdominis. Posterior wall is made by fascia transversalis. This is the inguinal region. This is anterior superior iliac spine, and this is pubic tubercle. And this yellow lunar structure is the lower end of external oblique. This external oblique, when it comes down, is going to turn in. Okay? It's going to turn in. And forms the inguinal ligament. This is the inguinal ligament. Other structures of the inguinal ligament is that it is going to have a hole for the external opening of the inguinal canal, and this is the, when it turns. This is the external inguinal ring, and part of the inguinal ligament is going to be attached to the pubis. It's called lacunar ligament. Now the femoral hernia is going to be lateral to the lacunar ligament. In this cadaver, you can see that the two pointers are holding the external, external opening of the inguinal canal. And you can see that this is the spermatic cord. These two arrows are pointing at lower end of external oblique. You can see the fibers <coughs> of the internal oblique because the external oblique has been cut. And this is the inguinal ligament. <coughs> In this drawing, it is showing me that this is the external opening of the inguinal canal, okay, and of course this is the inguinal ligament. The external opening has, of course, lateral crust and medial crust, triangular in shape. This is the inguinal ligament, the floor of the inguinal canal. We come back to the external oblique aponeurosis. Again, the anterior superior spine and pubic tubercle comes down and turns to form the inguinal ligament. So this is the anterior wall of the inguinal canal, and this is the floor. Leave it with light, forward.
مايكون هاي الانيميشنز لو يدوروا 50 سنة بس خلي ياخذوا راحتهم واحنا ناخذ راحتنا اوكي So this is the interior wall and the inferior wall. If we take off, if we take off the interior wall, we're going to see this. We're going to see the roof, which is curved, made of. Fusion or joint action of internal oblique and transverse abdomen. <coughs> Laterally, <coughs> the two muscles join and form what's called conjoint muscle. And when they take origin, they take origin from the inguinal canal, inguinal ligament, not all the way. And I've shown you the story of this. And they curve, and then they come and insert on the pubic tuber. And this is the opening of the inguinal canal, the internal opening. And so this is the arch of the roof of the inguinal canal. Now, and this sign indicating the posterior wall of the inguinal canal, which is fascia transversalis, of the inner side of the abdominal wall. This is the internal opening of the inguinal canal. And the inguinal canal contains spermatic cord, Okay, conjoint muscle, conjoint tendon. That's the floor, is the inguinal ligament, and the wall is fascia transversalis. Again, in this drawing, you can see that is the floor, the inguinal ligament. The roof is the arch of conjoint muscle, and then conjoint tendon. A hole in the fascia transversalis makes the opening of the internal canal. In this image, all the muscles have been removed and you can see fascia transversalis. And the beginning of the inguinal canal called the internal inguinal ring. Why should we care and, and study this problem? It's because there is a hernia. Small intestine comes and goes into the canal. Right? In many cases, the patient lies down and he pushes the intestine back and the hernia or the contents are back to normal. Again, somebody, this is internal or deep in wine ring. The testis at the very early stages comes this way, passes through the canal, goes through the superficial inguinal ring and settles in the bottom of the scrotum. This pathway should disappear, should be blocked. Okay? If it does not block, then the hernia is called congenital inguinal hernia. This is the opening of the internal inguinal ring. Okay? Seen from inside. This is the internal inguinal ring. Lateral to the inferior epigastric 
hard to look. The area which is triangular medial to the inferior epigastric artery. This is a place where direct inguinal hernia protrudes. And this is called Hasselbach triangle. So the inguinal canal has openings and they are in the form of rings. Internal inguinal ring is an opening in fascia transversalis. One centimeter above the mid inguinal point. Do I need this information? The answer is yes. To perform a test called obliteration test. The patient comes with big hernia. Now we ask the patient to reduce it, and we can see that as if there is nothing. Now, we go to this point. We go to this point and put our finger on it to block and ask the patient to cough. You can feel something is coming, touching our finger. We take off our finger and ask the patient to cough, and you can see the swelling coming down. So I need this piece of information. It is one centimeter above mid equinal point. If you are asked, do obliteration test now. And knowledge is power. If you start looking around, you don't know. But here is a sentence that is going to be used in the future. <coughs> external opening is in the aponeurosis of the external oblique, above and medial to the pubic tubercle. Do I need to know this sentence? The answer is okay. Now, you need to put your finger in the external opening, your little finger. Now, you have to go this way. If you put your finger this way, you are pressing the spermatic cord, which is very painful. The patient will curse you. So, at birth, Internal and external rings, they are on top of each other. There is no inguinal canal. And the testis finds the way very easily to go down. But with the differential growth of the abdomen, the whole body, the canal develops. They move apart and the canal becomes longer and oblique. This is a summary you will find on the mind map telling you what are the walls and openings of the inguinal canal. Remember, it is the small intestine that comes in sometimes even the large intestine and sometimes the urinary bladder. So we have to treat it cautiously. Now, what is this area? This is the inguinal ligament. This is the opening of the, the external opening of the inguinal canal. Inferior to the inguinal ligament, you find the femoral sheath. That's the femoral sheath. 
femoral artery comes down to supply the lower limb and the femoral vein goes in to continue as external iliac vein and it is joined by the great saphenous vein here and the most medial compartment of the femoral sheath is called femoral canal. Now, in this image, I can see the inguinal ligament here. This is fascia transversalis. You can see the internal opening of indirect inguinal hernia. Starting the inguinal canal, and I can see the place of direct inguinal hernia. If I come down inferior to the inguinal ligament, I can see that there's a bulge uh, coming from the, uh, the femoral canal. Okay, this is fascia transversalis. internal opening of inguinal hernia. This is the direct inguinal hernia. And here is the beginning of a femoral hernia coming from the femoral canal. This is the place of where the femoral canal is. This is the lacunar ligament, which is part of the inguinal ligament. Now, the, the Hernia is going to be lateral. Now, the femoral hernia comes down. Okay? It cannot go down more than that. Why? Because there is something preventing it from coming down into the thigh. And that is what? That is a fascia, which comes and attaches to fascia lata. This is scarpa's fascia. It prevents it from coming down. It gets larger, it's going to bulge anterior. Okay. There is something which is going to prevent it from expanding more anterior. And that is a hole in fascia lata, which is called what? Saphenous opening. This saphenous opening is closed by a, a fascia called cribriform fascia. It has holes in it for superficial arteries and veins to come out and supply the area, and there is an opening for the great saphenous vein. Okay. So the femoral hernia is going to do what? It has no way but to go up again, above or superficial to the inguinal ligament. So it is like this. When it becomes like this, and the intestine goes and being pushed into this area, it's hard to take out. It's hard to take out. It's a problem. Why should we care about hernia? It's because small intestine or a viscous any tube of the gastrointestinal tract is going to protrude and occupy the, this gap. This is what happens in the gastric hernia. See, the rectus sheath has holes, and through these holes, arteries and veins pass. In repeated increased intra-abdominal pressure. Now, something is going to protrude out into this hole. It 
is going to be painful. The patient comes to you and says, I have pain in the epigastric region. You say, if you are just an ordinary doctor, and there are so many of them, you will say, okay, you have gastritis. Pain in the, in the epigastric region is gastritis. Go modify your food, here is a drug. Patient comes and said, the pain is still there. Right? Go and put your hand on the epigastric region. It, this hernia may be very small. So an intelligent doctor will say, okay, you have pain in the, in the epigastric region. You may have gastritis, but let me feel the area. If I feel something, little nodule, it is epigastric hernia. That's the difference. Hernia progression. Okay, the hernia is a weak area in the abdominal wall small intestine or other structures protrude in and the patient can reduce it, push it back and continues his life or her life. What's, what's wrong about this story? The problem is when these contents, they do not go back. They are called strangulated. And when they do not go back, their blood supply is interfered with, and they become gangrenous. Now, we can, hmm? We care about hernia, because parts of the hernia is a sac, neck, and contents. We care much about the neck. If the neck is narrow, that's a problem. If the neck is wide, it is a problem, but less a problem. Thank you.